Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Welcome to the fourth lecture of the course on sociological perspectives on modernity. In the last lecture, we have discussed the central philosophical and political foundations of critical modernist paradigm in sociology, namely holism or totality, reflexivity, rationality and social movements. Okay? And, uh, and then, I mean these 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 four uh, ideas, okay? I mean these four central philosophical and political foundations of modernity, okay? They represent fields of intellectual conflict with the modernist paradigm. Competing theories, competing paradigms offer different concepts to no. fill these fields, fill the gaps in these fields. Not only competing theories, uh, not only do competing theories offer uh, different concepts to fill these fields, uh, but they also um, uh, provide different answers to these questions. Critics of modernism, on the other hand, argue that the questions themselves are the wrong ones and offer alternative ways of uh, defining the problem and even alternative problems. Okay? What appears to us as a problem should also be questioned. Okay? The problem may not be real, the problem may lie somewhere else, but we are, we are looking at a, at a wrong problem. Okay? It is this modernist uh, and anti-modernist uh, responses, uh, the, the, it is these modernist, non-modernist, anti-modernist responses to these questions and answering the question or rejecting the question and proposing a new question that, that uh, we discussed. I mean that, that we are also going to discuss uh, in the lectures to follow. And therein lies the ambiguity of rationality and control, I mean governance versus emancipation and in the last lecture we have discussed. Uh, the, the difference between uh, instrumental rationality on the one hand and substantive rationality on the other. Substantive rationality uh, looks at uh, or emphasizes on methods, emphasizes on the means, whereas instrumental rationality emphasizes on ends, objectives, aims, goals and so on. Okay? Keeping, keeping uh, now, now uh, we are uh, we have covered in this this course we have covered the thematic preliminaries now if you look at uh, uh, the broader outline that we sketched at the uh, uh, at the beginning of the course okay now we will discuss uh, sociological modernism i mean classic statements of sociological modernism okay uh, when I say classic statements of sociological modernism, uh, I mean it is through the works of Marx and Weber. Okay, okay. I mean, I mean before before delving into uh, 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 modernity uh, or or the or the way Marx and Weber's works have contributed immensely to the debates in modernity. Okay. Before delving into that, uh, let us first see when we say uh, uh, when we say uh, sociological modernism as such. Okay. Sociology, both as a mode of thinking and as an academic discipline, 
came into existence as an attempt to understand the dramatic transformations that western europe experienced between the mid point of the 18th century and the mid point of the 20th century i mean 1750s to to uh, 1950 okay i'll mention some of the, the some of the most obvious of these no doubt about it but we have to remember that these descriptions themselves and the categories they use are themselves products of this attempt to understand them i mean the concepts that we use to understand modernity are themselves modernist ones okay i mean when i say sociology as an academic discipline sociology as a mode of thinking sociology as an intellectual activity sociology as a social activity as a political activity okay it it refers to uh, sociology has to be examined both as a theoretical construct as well as a methodological device it is an attempt to understand the dramatic transformations that that western europe experienced between the mid 18th century and the mid 20th century okay what are these dramatic transformations i mean these dramatic transformations Uh, may be felt in terms of uh, at the at the realms of economy culture and polity okay what are these uh, 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 what are these economic shifts cultural transformation uh, um, uh, political changes and so on okay there is a there is a dramatic economic shift and whose most uh, visible effects include the transformation of agriculture into a profit oriented and increasingly technological activity with the marginalization of farm laborers and tenant farmers and their flight to uh, the growing urban centers of population okay i do not mean uh, rural urban migration only but i also look at, i also tend to look at rural urban continuum okay i mean not only that you see you you will look at uh, you, will, you will look at the development of large scale industrial manufacturing processes the corresponding decline on uh, decline of artisanal and home production and the rise of trade unions okay uh, against the powers that be and um, you will also see the increasingly global dimensions of trade as more and more of the world is drawn into the global economy and the non european world is increasingly turned into colonial positions designed to supply cheap or free labor basic commodities and protected markets for the imperial center i mean you know uh, uh, i mean i mean if you look at uh, uh, the 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 uh, the dependency theory okay i mean uh, uh, dependency theory i mean what uh, the 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 satellites the underdeveloped countries uh, um, the uh, the peripheral countries they they always try to the, i mean the system is has been designed in such a manner that they supply cheap or free labor uh, uh, free raw materials uh, uh, and and purchase the finished goods from the metropolis from the developed countries from the core countries okay at a much higher price okay okay these are the economic shifts that we we witnessed uh, on the cultural front there is a, there is there is uh, uh, there is i mean uh, i mean if you if you look at this i mean culture is transformed i mean uh, most visibly with the spread of literacy through uh, the developing mass education systems and the increasing significance of print media participation of individuals in national cultural formation and at the same time what we find that dominant languages increasingly marginalize other languages and dialects this is a serious problem now so many languages dialects they are dying out because of the politics uh, involved in uh, 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 or politics which is exercised in in making certain languages more dominant than others okay and the system of social control uh represented by 
the official churches breaks down, official religious systems breaks down, uh, particularly in urban areas. Okay, this is important in in the context of modernity. This is this is very important. Okay, where it does uh, retain some significance, it is as a power resource either for ruling groups in search of legitimation or as a, a rallying point for marginalized groups. On on the political front political changes that we, we witness, I mean there are there are uh, I mean there is a there is a dramatic shift in terms of politics. I mean democratic movements make monarchic and aristocratic power increasingly untenable and even authoritarian government increasingly requires the active participation of its citizens to sustain itself. Whether it may it may also be through manipulative electoral democracy. Okay? At the same time, the, the state's capacity, the capacity of the state to intervene uh, in, in matters of uh, economy, culture and polity is transformed by its growing power of administration and surveillance. The development of large scale standing armies based on uh, mass conscription uh, and its increasing significance as an economic actor. Okay? And this emerging power block is challenged by the growing workers movements, uh, democratic and socialist revolutions and rebellions become a central part of European political development, but meet increasing opposition from a modernizing and authoritarian right. In Indian context, we will find uh, uh, democratic movements, so we have we, we witness, uh, but, but, but those democratic movements, uh, they are not able to um, forge a, a for some kind of of an ideological platform to to give a rebuff to the state to give uh, a rebuff to imperialism okay uh, in 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 one sense keeping if i have to keep the the transformation which has been uh, transformations which have have been taking place at the realms of economic culture and polity I mean in one sense sociology can be said to said to come into being with the realization that that this phenomenon I mean industrialization and urbanization the rise of democratic nation state uh, and the death of God I mean decline uh, of religion in our social and cultural life uh, uh, I mean uh, uh, emergence of more and more secular value systems they are they must be interrelated in other words that a single explanation okay, is needed for this transformation and that it cannot logically be found within any of these fields as they are practiced at the time I mean theories of political economy normative philosophies of the state and abstracted and of often religious philosophy but that a wider term is required the historical and increasingly the social. At the same time, the observation of the breakdown of local particularisms and more particularly the observation of the increasingly international character of these transformations, I mean the industrial revolution, the revolutions of, of 1848, um, even the French revolution of 1789 and uh, the growth of the growth in communications, I mean it increases, uh, I, I mean it encourages. Uh, these 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 events encourage general explanations which are not limited to developments uh, with a single national history. Last but not the least, the word revolution applied to uh, applied at that time to what we now describe as the French and American revolutions, the agriculture and industrial revolutions, and so on, indicates the dramatic effect that these changes, these transformations had on contemporary observers, they were felt to be wholesale transformations from a previously static era um, uh, uh, and thus, thus to uh, and thus to point towards a concept of historical transformation, historical change of changes of transformations from one type of society to another. Already in 1789, 
old regime the the old regime is described as feudal increasingly the new type of society i mean why i am i am talking about 1789 precisely because i am trying to refer to the french revolution okay i mean i mean uh, already in 1789 uh, uh, the old regime okay uh, is often described as feudal pre modern uh, uh, and increasingly the new type of society is is described as modern or capitalist keeping these transformations in mind now we are going to discuss discuss two important thinkers whose works may be associated with modernity and perhaps perhaps these two important thinkers are the were the first of its kind first of their kind to reflect on modernity to reflect on uh, modernity not only as an intellectual enterprise but also uh, uh, the way they tried to understand society they tried to apply that understanding to transform society okay and uh, and post industrial revolution post french revolution um, post the great revolution of 1848 okay these two two thinkers assume greater significance okay and they are karl marx and max weber okay now now we'll we'll uh, we'll try to uh, uh, look at <coughs> uh, uh, we will start with marx then we'll move on to weber in the lectures to follow okay marx and and please remember this thing that uh, that uh, um, whenever i will be discussing marx and modernity i cannot uh, isolate marx from engels engels is as important as marx okay i mean uh, most important among the contributions of marx and his uh, uh, lifelong compatriot collaborator and comrade in arms frederick engels to the armory of humanities and social sciences are the principles of dialectic uh, and the materialist and the materialist conception of history that's what we have discussed in the earlier lectures that it is not the consciousness that what is materialist conception of history i mean it is not the consciousness of men that determines their social being or their social existence but on the contrary their being that determines their consciousness okay okay i cannot isolate marx uh, uh, from engels or i cannot isolate engels from marx okay uh, both of them must be uh, 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 discussed uh, on but why i am i am i have not mentioned engels and modernity and only marx on modernity uh, uh, but per perhaps perhaps uh, because of the range of ideas the range of topics that marx could uh, uh, touch up marx could master over okay marx and his collaborator engels are among the earliest and most perceptive of those observers who did not adopt either an affirmative modernist or straightforwardly reactionary position in other words who um, both marx and and uh, engels saw modernity as inevitable yet in many senses deeply undesirable okay you can look at suppose you can watch uh, modern times by charlie chaplin why modernity is in undesirable okay okay how 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 individuals human beings will uh, turn turn out to be machines okay will be reduced to machines okay in this in in in, in the way modernity has been sketched okay that's why marx and uh, uh, engels both saw modernity as inevitable yet in many senses deeply undesirable and who therefore sought to identify 
how modernity could itself be transformed into an ideal future rather than simply returning to an idealized past. Okay? It is very important. This, this latter option is rejected. I mean, we cannot go back to the idealized past. Okay? Uh, uh, this, 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 this option of returning to an idealized past is absolutely rejected, is rejected in its totality, in its in, in, in entirety okay? uh, among other reasons uh, simply because modernity is seen as itself a product of the past, a past society which is therefore not stable, but inherently like to gen likely to generate modern formations. Okay? This is very important. Okay? Then, then modernity even if it is inevitable, it is uh, undesirable in many senses. Okay. And perhaps for this reason, uh, uh, both Marx and Weber uh, 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 sought to identify how modernity could itself be transformed into an ideal future, not idealized past, but ideal future. Okay. And, and, and by not accepting or by rejecting uh, that return to an idealized past. Okay? Uh, it is important that how modernity is seen as itself a product of the past, a past society uh, uh, which is therefore not stable, okay? but inherently likely to generate modern formations. Okay? This is very important. Then, 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 but when we, but when we look at, uh, 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 look at uh, uh, Marx and modernity, okay, there are certain methodological uh, warnings. I just want to clarify before I move on to uh, uh, Marx and modernity. Okay. A word of methodological caution before we start. Marx and to a lesser extent Weber is a classic example of the difficulties involved in saying what so and so thought. Marx like Weber was immensely prolific. Some of his most important writings remained unpublished for decades after his death. Okay? Uh, the same is true for Weber as far as translations into English go and his immense intellectual and political status meant that many of his followers legitimated their own ideas by presenting them as supported by his authority. Okay? In uh, I mean I mean, when uh, Marx's works were published, I think Capital Volume One was published uh, during his lifetime. Capital Volume Two and Three were published posthumously. Most of his works were published after October Revolution. I mean, when the Communist Party of the Soviet Union Bolsheviks they started publishing, uh, reprinting. I mean, printing those texts after the October Revolution, okay? under the stewardship of both Lenin as well as Stalin. Okay? Uh, when, I, when I say that some of Marx's most important writings remained unpublished for decades after his death and his immense intellectual and political status meant that many of his followers legitimated their own ideas by presenting them as supported by his authority. We must remember that that uh, that uh, that a Marxist theory or a presentation of Weber's ideas may be quite far removed from what the uh, authors themselves wrote or thought. In so far as we can find that out, okay? Translation also has its own limitations. The way you uh, uh, present it, the way a political party makes another presentation of the same author's works, okay? Uh, I mean, a good example of this presented as Marxist political theory, a theory which derives in large part from Lenin rather than Marx or Marxist cultural theory, which often, often rests heavily on Gramsci. Okay? I mean, I mean this, this, this orthodox Marxism, okay? orthodox Marxism in the sense of uh, 
the theories approved by the parties of the fifth uh, international is something again different again. More generally, we need to remain aware of the possibility that just as medieval writers sought to give their ideas greater authority by ascribing them to some earlier author, contemporary writers often make substantive and independent contributions to social theory in the form of what are apparently interpretations and commentaries on earlier authors. The theories discussed in the two, uh, I mean in, 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 the, in, the, in the next two or three lectures, okay, uh, I mean I mean the theories uh, which will be discussed in the lectures to follow uh, uh, structuralism and western Marxism were often presented by their authors as simple interpretations of what Marx really meant, but they are better thought of as independent theories. This is one good reason for paying more attention to the ideas than the extent of their scriptural authority. Whether an idea is good or bad, right or wrong has nothing to do with uh, whether it can be found in the pages of Marx or Weber or not. If we are interested in what they themselves wrote, for example, if we are interested in how their different ideas interact and form a coherent perspective, we need to be aware of this difficulty and not always take commentators at face value. In particular, most negative evaluations of Marx and Weber that I have come across are based on uh, caricatures of their ideas which are far more complex and well founded than people who only know them at second hand tend to achieve. Okay. Then in this lecture, uh, I, mean, I mean now we are going to look at uh, Marx on modernity. I mean from, from here, uh, we, are, we are going to discuss uh, specifically uh, no. Marx on modernity. Okay. I mean Marx's view on modernity is deeply shaped by uh, his own involvement in the Europe of his day, I mean 19th century, uh, middle of the 19th century. He was um, an unemployed uh, uh, philosophy graduate uh, who became a radical journalist and as a consequence of this a political refugee. He was also a political activist involved with radical and socialist uh, organizations in Britain and France as well as in the first socialist international. Um, and, and most importantly though was his intense intellectual involvement with his own society. Uh, I mean, I mean, I mean the collected, the collected works of Marx and Engels uh, run to over 40 volumes on social philosophy, okay, uh, economic analysis and political comment uh, which taken together represent a phenomenal amount of empirical research. Okay. Okay. I mean, I mean Marx's in, in, in particular, in particular, okay, Marx's idea of modernity uh, was shaped by three developments. Okay. What are these three developments? Okay. One, German philosophy, two, British economy, three, the French politics. Okay. In a way, I mean the French revolutions of uh, 1789 and 1848 and the French theorists of revolution. Okay. I mean so far as French politics is concerned, so far as British economy is concerned, I mean the industrial and agricultural uh, revolutions in Britain and the British economists who theorized them and, 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 and so far as uh, German philosophy is concerned, uh, we must look at the collapse of the official um, churches. Uh, intellectual credibility as reflected in German philosophy. Okay. Uh, I mean this is this is very important. Marx's Marx's empirical starting point uh, for thinking about the new society is largely a projection of each of these developments in the future. Okay. And 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 
uh, sadly when he passed away in 1883, most of Europe was still agricultural and artisanal. Okay? Most European states were still dominated by monarchical power and most Europeans still went to church. In other words, when we describe the Europe of his day, I mean the Europe of Marx's day as being for example, uh, Europe of mm, uh, mass industrial labor. We are, uh, I mean when we, when we describe uh, the Europe of Marx's days mm, as being a uh, Europe of mass industrial labor, okay, we, are, we are falling into the worst kind of anachronism. It has been, I mean, it has been very often, very often said that Marx's analysis of industrial capitalism is based on the experience of the textile industry um, in Manchester alone. That is perhaps an exaggeration, but it is worth bearing in mind, okay, that the high point of industrial employment in France, for example, is only reached after the Second World War, okay. Taken in these terms as a, as a, as a, as a projection of, uh, uh, of an uh, emergent future, a new society, okay, we can understand Marxist thinking more clearly. Okay. This, is, this is very important that, that, that Marx's works are, are exhibition of top class, top notch empirical research. Okay. Perhaps, perhaps he, is, he, he, he was one of those few, okay, he is one of those few who could combine uh, uh, both uh, theory and practice. I mean, uh, when, when, when uh, I said uh, uh, German philosophy, for example, I mean, he took uh, uh, Marx, Marx borrowed the idea of dialectic from Hegel. And, and materialism from far back okay? uh, and then he tried to look at how the principles of dialectic may be sketched, okay? how the materialist conception of history may be sketched. Okay? Uh, um, if, you, if you look at um, uh, 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 Marx's philosophical and political orientations, okay. perhaps, perhaps uh, it is enormous, uh, uh, an intellectual giant on, uh, 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 in his own right. Uh, um, he could harness the literature of almost 10 to 12 centuries uh, in, 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 uh, very quickly. Uh, look at uh, the way he reflected on philosophy, literature, uh, uh, economics, uh, uh, political science, sociology, the nature of the state and so on. Okay? And, and, and even, even on sciences, okay? people, people very often uh, uh, ignore the aspect of, uh, of the ways in which he, he uh, contributed to the domain of science. For him, what is science? Science is a social creation. Right? This is very important. Okay? Uh, uh, in, in short, uh, if, if questions will be raised later on, then we can discuss in detail, I mean, what are the uh, principles of dialectic, what is materialist conception of history. But, but my, my, my concern is not to let you know uh, the principles of dialectic in detail. My, 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 the purpose of this course is not to look at only materialist conception of history in detail. Okay? My, the purpose of this course is to look at through the principles of dialectic, through the materialist conception of history, how one can understand Marx's view on modernity. This is important. Okay? When we look at this aspect, of Marx's views on modernity and, and similarly we, we, we look at uh, the, the through, through the lenses of the principles of dialectic and materialist conception of history. As I have already uh, said earlier, materialist conception of history suggests that, that uh, 
uh, how 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 I mean I mean materialism itself uh, suggests that how matter is prior to the formation of IDH, uh, and the principles of dialectic are threefold for Marx. One is quantitative changes lead to qualitative changes and vice versa. Secondly the interpenetration of the opposites or unity and struggle of opposites and thirdly the law of negation of negation but but with 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 the passage of time we, uh, we in due course of time will 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 try to capture these principles and by capturing these principles we'll try to look at marx's reflections on now uh, reflections on modernity okay this is important now, what we are going to do, we are going to look at Marx's idea of modernity, the way it has been set by three intellectual trajectories namely, uh, three intellectual and political trajectories namely, German philosophy, British economy and, and French politics. Okay. It is also important to look at Marx's views about modernity now, through this through those four central pillars of modernity i mean holism or totality reflexivity rationality and social movements they are very important how marx's views about modernity have contributed to the idea of holism or totality how marx's views about modernity have contributed to the idea of uh, reflexivity, how Marx's views about modernity have contributed to the idea of rationality, how Marx's views about modernity have contributed to the idea of social movements. I think this is this is very important and and let us see uh, how how uh, uh, Marx uh, um, or Marx's works have contributed to these domains to these central critical uh, themes, central uh, um, uh, pillars of modernity, central philosophical and political foundations of modernity. Okay. This is important. Okay. For it is it's, it's a, it's a common enough observation that for Marx, modern society is above all uh, capitalist society. I mean modernity or the capitalist mode of production is, is contrasted with an earlier society which is described as feudal, which is described as feudal as well as even earlier stages which we need not get into for, for the time being, I will we'll, we'll discuss. I mean what does this description uh, of, of modern society as capitalist uh, in fact mean? Okay. What, what, why, why? Uh, uh, for Marx, modern society is is uh, is nothing but a capitalist society because he tried to treat capitalism as a mode of production in contradistinction with all pre-capitalist social formations. Who? What are these pre-capitalist social formations? I mean, pre-industrial revolution pre-enlightenment and so on. Okay. In this sense, modern society is capitalist society. Okay. That is why the capitalist mode of production okay, must be contrasted with the earlier modes of production, okay. namely maybe slavery, maybe feudalism and so on. Then what do we mean by a mode of production? What are modes of production? Modes of production are a combination of forces of production and relations of production. Okay? You may say, uh, let me give you an example. Uh, suppose labor is a force of production. Technology is a uh, force of production. But when you come to relations of production, I may I may say property relations are, are a part of relations of production. Uh, 
uh, even even um, uh, division of labor is a relation of production and so on. Okay. And the way Marx uh, reflected on uh, different modes of production, I mean, he, he uh, and 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 he banked on historical sociology and political economy to to examine these modes of production. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, the way he tried to look at um, uh, the various stages of society uh, through different modes of production, starting with uh, hunting and gathering economy, okay, uh, then slavery, then feudalism, and then with the enlightenment, with the in, uh, with the industrial revolution, we we tend to witness uh, capitalism, okay. And then Marx obviously said that uh, no capitalism also cannot thrive because of the inherent contradictions that the, the which are embedded uh, uh, in capitalism uh, and 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 which will move on to which will uh, uh, unstoppably uh, undeniably move on to uh, uh, socialism and thereafter communism. I am not trying to get into those things right now, uh, but but I am trying to look at Marx's views about uh, modern society as reflected in the capitalist society. Okay. Many, many uh, uh, scholars think that uh, Marx was a, was a great thinker of socialism or, or, or communism, uh, but for me uh, Marx was, a, was perhaps, perhaps uh, uh, till now is one of the greatest thinkers uh, of uh, of capitalism first okay because he was a product of capitalism he was not a product of socialism or communism he was a product of capitalism okay marx marx that's why modern society as capitalist society one must understand okay for i mean i mean marx described his social theory as the materialist conception of history okay and this this materialist conception of history which is popularly known as historical materialism i don't want to get into the nitty gritty of that but i, I always prefer uh, uh, the, the the original uses of the term the materialist conception of history has two primary starting points okay the first is the assumption that humanity is primarily social, that its species being is one based around interaction rather than around isolated individuals. Then that those that species being, okay, even Darwin also talked about species being, Charles Darwin, evolution of species, principle of natural selection, okay, origin of species. Okay. Our 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 existence, the way we think, our thinking, our self-knowing as well as self-creating okay, is primarily social and that its species being okay, is, is one, is the one based around interaction. If we do not interact with each other, then we will cease to exist. We are not isolated individuals. Okay. And the second, I mean, I mean, and uh, I mean, um, uh, in this in this context, um, um, interestingly, um, uh, uh, Marx, uh, uh, in a, in a polemical manner, uh, uh, he he mentioned against Robinson Crusoe's approach of economists such as. Adam Smith, who see individuals as somehow being born, brought up, and working in initial isolation from one another until they start to exchange goods. Instead, uh, Marx, I mean, Marx observes uh, that human beings are always found in uh, found in uh, social contexts. Okay, if you look at this, uh, human beings uh, uh, are always found in social contexts. What is that social context? Okay, uh, I mean their characteristic activities. What sets them apart from other species are all social ones. 
what differentiates a human species from other species? That species is human which is engaged in the production of its own sustenance, production for its own sustenance. Other species they depend on nature for their survival, whereas human beings not only depend on nature, but also control nature for their survival. There, there, there are two things. The, the earlier literature suggests that no only nature controls, nature was treated as the subject and human beings as the objects. Then people also said no, no, no human beings are subjects, but nature is the object because the way we control nature, we, we master over nature. But, but, uh, but, uh, but a few perceptive thinkers such as Marx mentioned that no, we not only depend on nature, but also control nature. There is a dialectical relationship between nature and human beings. Okay? That is how he, he, he brought about a critique to uh, metaphysical school of thought. Okay? I mean metaphysics suggested that all social changes, economic changes, political changes they happen because of, because they are naturally mediated okay? as against theologians. Theologians suggested no, every all changes are because of supernatural forces. Metaphysicians suggested no, whatever changes that we witness they are because of, because they, I mean they are, they are basically they are naturally mediated. Whereas, whereas, uh, 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 whereas perceptive thinkers like Marx suggested no, there must be a dialectical relationship between nature and human beings. Okay? Human beings not only depend on nature, but also know how to control nature. Okay? Then the way metaphysicians attributed or metaphysicians uh, tried to contemplate on nature only, Marx provided the link uh, that no human beings uh, not only contemplate on nature, but also control, control nature, but also master over nature. There is, there is a shift in the faculty of contemplation to faculty of control. Okay? I mean if you if anybody wants to uh, uh, look at uh, man nature relationship, I mean human beings nature relationship. Um, women nature relationship, I mean human beings nature relationship, uh, please you can, you, you can look at capital volume 1 by Marx. Okay. Then when I say human beings are always found in social contexts, okay, economic contexts, political contexts, cultural contexts, institutional contexts, ideological contexts, okay. I mean their characteristic activities what set them apart from other species are all social ones. And the second, second starting point of, of the materialist uh, conception of history is the defining characteristic of humanity is productive labor. I mean what is that productive labor? That is not only contemplation, but also control that the transformation of nature into material to meet human needs. Okay. This labor for Marx involves uh, both mental and physical components. Unlike insects, humans, uh, um, unlike insects, uh, you will find that we know how to plan our labor. Okay. Uh, insects, people may say that no insects, animals, birds, they also plan their labor. No, it is only uh, based on their instincts that they that they are engaged in those activities. But human species go beyond their instincts, they put their empirical rationalist uh, phil, uh, thought processes to plan their labor. Equally important, uh, equally importantly, this, this, this labor which involves both mental as well as physical aspects, physical components, this, this, this labor, this productive labor, okay, usually carried out with techniques. They are called forces of production 
and within relations of ownership which are called relations of products which represent interaction rather than isolation. Although Marx accepts that there are limiting cases such as the small holders after the French revolution whose ownership of the land they worked and subsistence farming restricted their interaction to a very great extent. The best statement of this materialist conception of history is found in the first volume of the German ideology in, in the German ideology. Okay. Um, this is this is uh, uh, very important uh, when when we when we uh, look at this uh, this this aspect of materialist conception of history. Okay, I mean productive labor. I mean what what we have discussed. Uh, the the materialist conception of history has two primary starting points that 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 uh, it is based on the assumption that that humanity is primarily social and the second one the defining characteristic of humanity is productive level. Okay. Very often, very often uh, 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 these days especially okay, we, we talk about capital, we talk about investment, we talk about entrepreneurial skills, we talk about land. But, but the most important component among all four, four uh, among all four factors of production remains labor. Okay. Land is, is, is a fixed variable, is a constant variable. Land in, in more sense than one, you will find land is a fixed variable, constant variable to a great extent. Okay. Whereas capital is generated by labor land also becomes fertile by the inputs of labor entrepreneur what is who is an entrepreneur it is one more labor that is why the way Marx tried to de bank on uh, Adam Smith, David Ricardo especially David Ricardo okay, they looked at labor as an important component while viewing modernity capitalist society. Okay. In, in, in any, any, um, any, um, uh, in any given society, Marx argues uh, uh, a particular combination of these forces of production uh, and relations of production, which he describes as a mode of production will, will dominate all others, whether it was in slavery or feudalism or capitalism and so on. Thus, in, in society that he saw emerging an industrial technology okay, dependent on large scale investment was driving out artisanal production, more generally relations of production based on small scale production for one's own use of relations of serfdom um, uh, or uh, relations of slavery. Um, um, of an aristocratic lifestyle based on conspicuous expenditure uh, were being replaced by a polarization. Okay. Those who had no access to uh, the means of production and who therefore had to sell their labor power to those who controlled the means of production uh, through ownership of capital. That is why labor is in the first in, in, in um, uh, uh, labor is in the uh, um, uh, uh, first place uh, a process in which both human beings and nature participate and in which human beings of their own accord start, regulate and control the material reactions between themselves and nature. They oppose themselves to nature as one of their own forces setting in motion arms and legs, head and hands the natural forces of their body in order to appropriate nature's productions in a form adapted to their own wants, their own needs. By thus, I am, I am, I am, I am, I am trying to quote Marx here, by thus acting on the external world and changing it, human beings at the same time change their own nature. 
they develop their slumbering powers uh, their their slumbering powers um, and compel them to act in obedience to their sway we are not now dealing with those primitive instincts instinctive forms of labor that remind us of uh, of of uh, remind us of the mere animal and an an immeasurable uh, interval of time separates the state of things in which human beings bring their labor power to uh, to market for sell as a commodity uh, 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 from that state in which human labor was still uh, uh, in its first instinctive stage we presuppose labor in a form that stamps it uh, as exclusively human then what is that what is that uh, 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 what do we mean by a commodity a commodity is the one in 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 capitalist mode of production is the one uh, which has got value in exchange okay there is a difference between value in use and value in exchange suppose water has more value in use but today water also has become a commodity because it is uh, bought and sold in the market but a diamond it has got more exchange value okay not uh, not use value as such more exchange value okay okay then then when you i mean i mean what what uh, how how marx tried to to uh, try to look at uh, 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 the distinction between human species and other species in in capital volume 1 he wrote a spider conducts operations that resemble those of a weaver and a bee puts to same many an architect in the construction of her cells but what distinguishes the worst architect from the best of bees is this that the architect raises his or her structure in imagination before she or he erects it in reality okay that's why when when productive labor when i said i mean the the uh, i mean human beings plan their labor unlike insects unlike unlike non human species okay okay insects or non human species they 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 are engaged in activities through instinct but but uh, but what distinguishes even the best of the inst- insects from the worst of the human species is that is this that the architect i mean the the human species now uh, they they can raise their structure in imagination okay before they erect it erect that those things erect it in reality at the end of every labor process we get a result that already existed in the imagination of the laborer at its commencement okay the laborer not only effects a change of form in the material on which he wor- or she works but she or he also realizes a purpose of her or his own that gives the law to her or his modus operandi and to which she or he must subordinate uh, her or his will and this subordination is no mere uh, uh, momentary act besides the exertion of the bodily organs the process demands that during the whole operation the workman will be steadily in consonance with this purpose this this implies close attention i mean the less see or he is attracted by the nature of the work the mode in which it is carried on and the less therefore see or he enjoys it as something which gives play to his bodily and mental powers the more close her his uh, or uh, his attention is forced to be okay 